And so without further ado, I wanted to go ahead and introduce Alina Gregorian, um, who is our organizer for the evening. Um, Alina Gregorian is a poet and artist. She is the author of Flags for Adjectives and Navigational Clouds. Her first gallery exhibition was Talk to Me in Parsley and Tambourines, Artists of the Armenian Dis Diaspora at Baby Castles. Please give it up for Alina. Hi. Thank you to Ken Chen and Tiffany Lay and to the Asian American Writers Workshop for hosting us tonight. And thank you for the readers for coming and for everyone for showing up. Um, this is a really special event and I'm just really happy to share this space with everybody. April 24th is Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day. The Armenian Genocide, which took place between 1915 to 1924, was responsible for the lives of 1.5 million Armenians. Many Armenians who survived fled to neighboring countries in the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, and so forth. The genocide forced many Armenians to, into new homes and new cultures. When I think about what it means to be Armenian, I think of the Armenian diaspora, and I'm reminded of my own family. My parents were born in Iran. I speak fluent Armenian, but my vocabulary is heavily sprinkled with Farsi. We use Farsi words so often they are part of our Armenian dialect. In some cases, I don't know the Armenian translations to the Farsi words I use. For Armenian Christmas, we eat a dish called kuku sabzi. In Iran, kuku sabzi is traditionally eaten for Nowruz, Persian New Year. I'm so accustomed to Persian food that when I was in Armenia for the first time, I frequented a Persian restaurant wanting to feel at home. When I went to Armenia, I thought the trip would show me what it meant to be Armenian, and it did. But I didn't find it in Armenia. I found it in my own family background, an Armenian history seeped in Persian culture. April 24th is a day to remember the genocide, and I believe it is a day to celebrate the various Armenian identities that exist. Each year that we commemorate the genocide, we can reflect on our existing foundations, build new memories, and realize once again what it means to be Armenian. So the readers tonight are Nancy Agabian, Christopher Janigian, Lola Kondakjian, and Rafi Joe Wartanian. And I'm just going to read their bios, and then we're just going to do a reading. And um, afterwards, we're going to have a Q&A where you can ask some questions and hear a little more about our stories and our writing. Nancy Agabian is the author of Princess Freak, a collection of poetry, prose, and performance texts, and a memoir, Me as Her Again, True Stories of an Armenian Daughter which was a finalist for a Lambda Literary Award in LGBT nonfiction and shortlisted for a Soroyan International Writing Prize. Both books tell stories of coming of age and generational trauma resulting from the Armenian Genocide of 1915, with a focus on gender and sexuality. Nancy's recent novel, The Fear of Large and Small Nations, tells the story of an abusive relationship that illuminates the complex, often contradictory processes of self-determination that bind the Armenian diaspora and its homeland. It was a finalist for the 2016 Penn Bellwether Prize for Socially Engaged Fiction. A recent nominee for a Pushcart Prize, Nancy teaches creative writing at New York University and the New School. Christopher Janigian's poems appear in Boston Review, Penn Poetry Series, Poor Claudia, Web Conjunctions, and Prelude, among other places. And he holds a degree from Brown and Columbia. Lola Kondakjian enjoys reading in her city of adoption. She writes in Western Armenian and in English and is co-curator of a poetry series at the Zorab Information Center and director of the online Armenian Poetry Project. She is the author of The Accidental Observer and Advice to a Poet. Writer and musician Rafi Joe Wartanian is the grandson and great-grandson of Armenian genocide survivors from Adana, Hajin, Karpert, and Zara. His work has appeared at Lincoln Found Center, The Baltimore Sun, and No Dear Magazine, among others, and has received support from the Fulbright Program, Eurasia Partnership Foundation, and Humanity in Action. Rafi is currently pursuing an MFA in nonfiction creative writing at Columbia University, where he has taught and organized creative writing workshops at Rikers Island, Jail Complex, and the Manhattan VA. He is also developing new instrumental compositions on oud and guitar, as well as a feature screenplay about a Texas gun show. Thank you once again for coming. Thank you to the readers. And um, the first up is Nancy Agabian. Hello. Thank you, Alina, for bringing us together. Um, 
I'm very grateful and honored to be here. Um, and also at the Asian American Writers Workshop where I've um, learned so much over the years. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so given the day, um, I've decided to read a couple of Armenian writers that I've been spending a lot of time with, and I'll also read a little of my own work. Um, so the first writer I'll read is Zabel Yesayan, who was a 19th century feminist Armenian writer. She was one of the only women, um, there was a, a blacklist um, that targeted intellectuals um, on April 24th, 19, 1915. So um, she escaped the genocide and lived in exile in France. And I wrote um, an essay about her in this anthology called Fierce Essays by and About Dauntless Women. Um, I'll read a passage from her novella my Soul in Exile, which is about a painter living abroad who returns to Constantinople in the years before the genocide of 1915. Um, so at the, at the time she was writing this novella in 1922, she said in a letter that it was a refuge where there is neither massacre, nor deportations, nor Bolsheviks, nor anything else, but only sunshine, roses, and the eternal song of love, beauty, and grace. So I'm gonna read an example of that. It's a passage in which she describes making rose petal jam. The whole house and even the street is full of the pungent, penetrating scent of roses. It is an excess of fragrance. The maid, another woman who has come to help out, and even my aunt, their heads spinning from a mild case of rose poisoning, have to interrupt operations from time to time and leave the room for a breath of fresh air. But the smell of roses pervades the whole house, the stairs, and the kitchen, where some of the petals are already boiling away in wide-mouthed copper pots. In the spacious room in which I've hung my paintings, the rose's unrelenting fragrance pursues me, saturates me. The air I breathe seems to grow thicker and makes me tipsy. Dizziness, a sudden malaise, rubber knees, and the reflection of my face in the mirror is pale, blanched white, even if my eyes are burning with fever. The whole neighborhood is permeated by that smell, it is rose season and many different houses exhale the gradually diminishing aroma. Slipping out of open windows and doors standing ajar, the fragrant waves spread through the air while the ladybugs, entranced by their favorite flower, buzz in the sun and fly every which way, instinctively trying to find their way to the roses piled up on the divans, trays, and tabletops. The maid brings rose jam for us to taste in small crystal dishes. It is wonderful. This is not eating, but rather feeling, assimilating what is the most intangible and fleeting for our senses, aroma and color. Um, and the other um, poet I'm going to read from is um, Diana Durhovanesian, who passed away last year. Um, she was largely responsible for translating Armenian poetry into English, and she was also an incredible poet in her own right. Um, and Lola and I and a few friends did a tribute to her last month at the Associated Writing Programs Conference. So we spent a lot of time thinking about her and remembering her. Um, and I wanted to read one of her poems that I think also speaks to this idea of refuge, um, but as a descendant of the genocide. So this is called Thanksgiving, and it starts with an epigram by Edna St. Vincent Millay. Love is not all, 
it is not meat nor drink. Nor is food love, but palate sport alone. Even with ceremony, without toast or vow, it is just means of keeping flesh on bone. But table and altar are confused somehow. We substitute our food again, again, for rites of love. Look how this buffet sinks with golden fowl and platters of grain and candles for our eyes to drink. Love is not food, but in the name of those with parched throats who could not eat or pray, whose empty mouths have closed, whose bellies swelled with pain, not meat. We call it sustenance when it is shared, and sharing we call prayer. So I'm going to read a poem that I wrote a couple of years ago um, after I met two different Armenians on two consecutive days. And both times, we immediately told each other our whole family history and where we were from. Um, so this is called Raise and Eyes. When meeting for the first time, we tell each other where our grandparents come from, on both sides, village or city, state and nation. We know what the places were called by Armenians and what they were called by Turks, Kurds, Georgians, and Persians. We trace back time, threading a necklace with beads, round and black, like a child's eyes. Chamich Achker, my mother said to me, because her mother said it to her, because her mother said it to her. It doesn't matter if you're the granddaughter of a survivor from Sepastia by way of Providence or a jeweler in Jackson Heights with roots in Tiflis going back seven generations. The jeweler resembles Parajanov, dark face and hair, black and silver. He fixes my aunt's necklace restringing the loose black beads and tying knots between. It's just costume jewelry, but she passed away last spring, so I want it intact. The jeweler's eyes are iridescent, so dark they reflect the fluorescent light of the store, or maybe he's calling up the ghosts of his ancestors as he tells me how much he misses his home 17 years later. He says it's much better back there, Mother and father provide everything for a very young couple, house, car, furniture, even the dishes. And then when they go to college, the grandparents help to raise their children. Yeah, I'm not so crazy about that, I tell him and laugh, my queerness hidden. Then the parents have too much control and the children don't learn who they are outside of the family. Yes, he says, but when I grow old, I want my children to care for me. I live alone, so I cede him this point. My family extends, I tell him, with people in endless directions. I lived in Armenia for a year, and I miss the sense of togetherness. Here we are all working so hard because no one is helping each other. There is a saying, the jeweler says, your neighbors are your closest family. Ring their doorbell and ask for a tomato. If you do that here, you're crazy. But there can be a downside too, he swings back, when everyone knows every step you make, every bite you swallow. He ties the last knot to the clasp, and I notice the small gold cross around his neck. Smiling, he hands me my lineage. We are beads scattershot across the earth, our grandparents from names of places that change. As he buzzes me out of the store, I hold the repaired necklace in my hand, looking down at the rows of Chamich Achker. Your eyes are like raisins, my mother said, which never made sense to me. Yes, they are brown, nearly black, but raisins are wrinkled and dry, eyes smooth and glassy. But she said it was so much love, I couldn't help but hold on.
and I'll, I'll read one last poem. Um, this is brand new. Uh, I wrote it on the plane going to AWP, the writers' conference, when I was feeling insecure. It's called, I'm an Ancient People. <laughs> my features evolved beyond my face so I can absorb the world. My eyes black pupils seeing dim light. My nose a flower, honey extracted from fart. My mouth a smile, a tear in the lying carpet of oligarchs. I'm an ancient people and a sage, celebration and terror treading my DNA. I'm an ancient people, not to be confused with ancient grains like spelt or kamut. You cannot brand me or stretch my fiber. I travel like a spore on wind, the globe my home. I'm an ancient people. I laugh at the dark and cry with babies, nanny to the meek and forsaken. I'm an ancient people, my gender a cipher, pronouns long not, my soul communal slipping into your cracks, my future uncertain, sensitive to heaven and hell, skittering a spot on the ocean to surface, to survive, with God's sperm in our belly, stars exploding, the synapses of race, metaphors made of mud, then shattered to shards, only to find an ancient people still bleeds into one. Thank you. Please, please welcome Alina. Hi again. That was so great. Okay. So um, I wrote a series of poems that use Persian words, um, kind of just sprinkled in. And these are the words that I have always used growing up um, because I, I speak fluent Armenian. I started to learn Persian on my own and I, would, I was looking like a, at a list of vocab words for like fruits and vegetables. I was like, I know like most of these words. And I put together a list of all the words I would come across and then I started to be able to recognize how the sounds of the words were of the Persian words were far different than the sounds of the Armenian words. And as I was speaking with my family, I would say, oh yeah, this word, chas, for instance, for tape, is that Persian? Sounds kind of Persian. They're like, yeah. And so I, I have a list of 65 words and, and I use them in my poem. So does anyone here speak Persian? Okay. Home is a paper clip you bend towards. And also, I'm, I'm using them not in their proper way, um, nouns or verbs, and etc. The language I'm learning I've already known, like bottom John curtains and former vowels. I, see, I speak chob except when I didn't know. The language I'm learning has been on my tongue before, like shalvar when I'm hungry, or favorite shirts worn to bed. The tooth ferengi you repeat to yourself while falling asleep. Take me to the conditional unknown. I'll cholase the books while waiting for you. Let's go home, the rice is ready. Turquoise portrait inside an apricot tree. If I eat enough lavashak, I will be made queen in the forgotten forest. But there are no forests in Kahu place. I speak in idioms so you will understand me. Everything is real next to the Torshi moon. That's what I told myself one Chutkar afternoon. We see ourselves in ourselves, and when we buy Havij, we see ourselves again. I look like everybody in my family because we all wear hats on the same holiday and our hilltops are stolen and golden underneath the abacus sky. Tea washed rugs dipped in sun. April was the horse they gave me. They tried to give me chalvat, but I said no. I am a house with trees. I climb mountains when it's cold. Let's hat man the, the disaster of the typewriter. The sun keeps speaking Masalan, and I need that. Where should we place your ship if your Yani is on the ceiling? And when the yellow couch revolts, who will calam us? We'll build fountains on your arm, a triangle inside your ship. Sailing a ship in space. I'm reminded of Aram Saroyan's light. What beauty and fleeting joy to be able to Jafari movement. 
The Kharid is in the basics, but the basics aren't Keef. To place a plant on a table, to wonder why the stars shake. Aram Saroyan is Armenian, just like the hat on my head. We walk in serenades and feel happiness warp into science. This is the, re the year Rehan is real. Wanting to feel warmth, I turn towards it, shielding my eyebrows. Aram Saroyan's light is an ever-expansive sunset peeking through the blinds. Have you travel traveled a dozen oceans? Do you Zaytun the planets? Hello, sun. This is a very nice day for you, and for me, and for you too. Thanks. I'll just read a couple more. Um, an ood about the way I think about you. Trees on my socks, green rival, rivers spiraling upward, the clear horma reflecting even the similar day. This is the sunlight hour, the reason for books, the makeup of normal afternoons splotched with gray and have ass. Take a boat, go to the edge of Hala, but nothing there will remind you of the echo of a neon flower. I too am spirally when I am awake, tired when I am dreaming. There are two clouds on top of each other. Let's ask Lan to be like them. Salted cucumber with radishes. There is a metaphor in that tree and suddenly everything is tree. Like Talebi in the middle of the ocean or a space station demanding to be seen. When we say khiar, what we're thinking about is the whirlwind at the door. The condition of reality that we Gharveda understand. I speak to you in Armenian. It's the only way I know to be real. The squiggly lines are not squished, but they are round. They are so sphere. Chairs on AstroTurf landscape. This green light behind my computer screen shines when everyone is asleep. The blue notebook on the desk, the camera in the corridor. These are the ways you feel alive. These are the ways Fuzul is real. Like cool mint on a summer's day, like triangle on a winter's night. Look at the pile of books on the vintage Malafe. Look how they zang and chasp. I want to compose songs under the fluorescent sky, dance many sonatas. We learned a new language by dreaming of yellow rooftops trying to conjure a place where things matter, but only because they do. So I have two more. The keyboard is green like a tangerine. There's a square in the sky, and it's larger than it was yesterday, like a basket of happiness disguised as golden turnips, like maguey on a foggy day. When you dance, do you imagine yourself as a pear, dancing through Hata with a backpack full of books? Or do you feel like a mountain goat, finding peace through the storm? When I think of geometry, I think of you. The shape of your existence is cute. You are a cello kebab that is so many things. When I think of Veleshkon, I think of lavender and treetops. Take me to the moon with you. There is so much moon to see there. Films boasting of Tehran. Here we see streets lined with apricots, museums measured for sequined garments, patches through gilas-filled wallpaper. Everything smells like roses and nay. There we see monuments of yesterday, carpentry and figurative speech remind us of oud players marching down the boulevard. Take me back to the Khiaban, where I once had a pe peach on a plate, where I saw you zeresh sheep into the grove. When it was summer, now winter is casting its glare, asking us to settle down. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you to everyone in this room for coming, um, and everyone not in this room. Um, I'm going to be reading um, from a series of poems that grew from watching the movie The Promise for the first time. And um, that was sort of the major motion picture that captured um, the genocide recently. And um, also this series grew out of um, learning that one of the villages where my family's from is um, underwater. So um, here we go. Pirate. 
I first go through the orchard. It looks lit from above, but there are rumors of fabric sewn under the leaves. Really, it's me pouring over from the crowd below at this angle. I cannot tell if they are fishermen. Like the time I stared at them and saw egg whites. They were just unfolding the light rips of blue foil, the blue fish that were disgathering before me with the crack of a bed, waiting for me to smother it in ash and purge it of a sad picnic below where the people sat. No central figure among them now in their borrowed ship in the coins of a tantrum. I wake to the flickering of their fun. I wake to a soft green glow and some yarn in a pile by my sheets. I wake to get on that ship, disgathering before me with the crack from the borders belonging to no time but this washing pool I dip myself into as the horizon line diffuses in unclear cuts from the street. Multi-pirate. Do not want to watch him dance, but do, and saw water gather gray, gray. Pirates multiply inside me, hook the corner of mine eye, Cannot tell if his eyes open or think if I rid the man and find his face floating behind my couch. Then see me, ye pirate, a drifting head, long hair, floor kiss. When he reached me, he crumbled into dried carnations. He cried. I am raking his pile in the yard pour handfuls of water on his petals. Water, I took no mercy. He is in my chest. Navy wool laughing in circles around me. He is a pirate, I think. Tomorrow, I will wear a different shirt. Pirate. I shiver a little. I watch the pencil go fast and then slow. I break off a piece of dried skin and try to fold it in two, but it's already glued. So I look out the window and see you in a fur coat and the sword you hold neon in this type of light. I run my hand over the ditch where they pulled you out. My arms turn heavy as the bronze railing I rest my elbow on as heavy as the spokes of the wheel I carve, a certain chain of events that goes like this. I was walking, I took some water that was not mine, and then I was speeding down the cold street. I was wondering if it was real or merely lightless. And I wondered if the pile of bodies that made the well water pink was real. If I meet someone different, would the stone wall hold out the intruders I am thinking of? that round edge where peck met peck, and the fanning of fingers was glimpsed at a point in time as on a museum wall or in a story passed down, as if the planes between boy and mother were the same and their faces will be able to change. This is the last poem and it has two different voices in it that um, are in italics, but I'm just gonna read them as one, um, oh, pirate fluid. There is a place that resembles my ship in which I and my pirate washed my feet. I remember that ritual, water coming into the creases of the wood, my ears and eyes strung together, a flash of polished glass I would like to suck on. The heads were all singing in a line on a pole with a gaze that started to harden. Oh, how I harden. Traveling to the wash 
with a sense of becoming, I become more mouth, less teeth, than sleep for 40 days, my drowsy steam peeling the tarpaulin away, sleep that washed artificial, a fluid coming through the door, and the lights turn teal and indigo, clamps on my hair, and are drooling down my back, soft egg white semblance. I was to sit there and watch every pirate come. I was to wonder about my job to be captured without being imprisoned. Now I wonder, gentlemen, how gentle are you? He is coming to me right now, what am I? What could I do? How can I ever really say, hello, sir? I circle his veins. RNA, DNA, lavender river, speak in my tongue, flower of my flower and lapis of my eye. There is a pirate in my room. He was moving, then he was cut out of time. I never said I could provide for him. I became one with the interruption of him, and then one with him. The space around me flat. I press myself out, then push myself in. Ye drown in this fluid. There is a pirate in my room. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, AAWW. Can you hear me OK? Thank you. Thank you. And Alina for inviting me and starting a new tradition. I'm going to read uh, two poems about uh, my Armenian side and something about New York City, where I've lived most of my life now, on food, family, and loss at the market. It's a matter of patience, a matter of really wanting to cook. The instructions are simple. Cut, chop, heat the pan and add oil, then add spices and the ingredients. Let simmer, mix once in a while, and voila. The difficulty comes in finding the ingredients. Our busy lives do not forbid us from cooking. They prevent us from going to the farmer's market on Saturday and schmoozing with the lettuce guy a relationship which, set on the right course, will bring you ramps in the springtime, then garlic scapes in early summer, leading to dinner invites where the farmer arrives with a bouquet of heirloom tomatoes. Or, in another scenario, going to visit somebody I know here, Nancy, go to, in Jackson Heights for Indian spices, where you ask a woman next to, next to you at Patel Brothers, on a scale of 1 to 10, is this curry an 11? And she will answer that in her country, it is mild enough for breakfast, which you guess is a polite exaggeration. Or on another Saturday, hoofing it to New Jersey, first in a small van for $2.50, which drops you at the Armenian bakery where you buy a dozen lahmacuns, then walk six blocks to the Turkish market to get cheese, pistachios, and dried vegetables from the city where your grandparents were born, then try to reconstruct their lives through a sample of taste bud experiences Wondering if they liked their cheese salty, or was it just a way to preserve it? Wondering if a trip back to Hassan Bailey is possible. Wondering what our lives would be like if we had never been forced off those lands. Imagining my great-grandfather's estate. If my family members had not been persecuted for their ethnicity, and we had stayed behind, would I have been a writer still? Would I have been a spinster, a mother, a grandmother by now? Would I have been a culinary explorer, going to faraway markets to purchase special ingredients to make for my family and friends? In what language would I be shopping? Would I have the same hobbies and pastimes? Would I have the same opportunities to explore music from different parts of the world? Would I have traveled extensively? I am certain my life would be unrecognizable, yet more organic growing on the land of my forefathers, knowing my extended family well, the continuity of things, passing down knowledge, recipes, clothes, and family heirlooms. A feeling of loss. I will never know what my great-grandfathers looked like, where, my homes, where their homes were, how they decorated their rooms. I will never know if I inherited my hair color, looks, styles, 
the shape of my brows, the color of my eyes from them. I will never know what vistas they looked upon a hundred years ago when they sipped their morning coffee, what music they listened to, if they grew some of their food, whether or not they made preserves. I will never know what layers of my soul I am missing. A few years back I was in London and decided to go to a museum off the beaten path and ended up at the Wallace Collection and saw so this beautiful painting of a woman dressed in red by a French Orientalist painter and it was entitled Portrait of an Armenian Woman. She wears her traditional dress and jewelry on her wedding day or perhaps at her son's baptism. Her firstborn in the arms of godparents, the procession on the altar, the priest anointing her dewy child and blessing him. But why this gaze of sadness? Is a premonition weighing her mind. A century separates us and I wish to tell her she was right. There were many executions and deportations without justice or recognition. I want to know her name. Did her family survive? Could I be her descendant? And finally, an ode to New York City. I was a visual uh, artist for 25 years, and uh, so a lot of um, uh, the arts permeate my work. In search of Rilke at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, after a reading of Archaic Torso. A Sunday afternoon, the final lazy weekend of the summer, I escape to the cool, bright corridors of that art institution. I am in search of Apollo or Rilke. In the Hellenistic and Roman wing, I find Hermes, Eros, Heracles, headless torsos of young men and women, centaurs, athletes, and heroes. I turn around each statu statue and sepulcher, reading labels and descriptions. In desperation, I ask a guard, but she's clueless. I search for him in a cubiculum nocturnum, that is to say a bedroom, in galleries, in the faces and camera lenses of tourists, finally finding him in through old-fashioned help, the humble assistance of the information desk clerk. There are two Apollos here, one in worse shape than the other, one slightly taller, one still resting against a marble trunk, one with more genitals intact, more of the hip areas defined, with both feet, perfect toes, and toenails. The Japanese tourist photographs her friend grabbing, or is it covering, the genitals. I hear the guard laughing heartily. Men, women, and children walk by. Few stop by to look at the headless torso. Few read the description. Few acknowledge that this was Apollo. This was the god of music and poetry, son of Zeus, father of Orpheus, one of the 12 Olympians, D.E. Consentis. Who cares for those lesser gods and heroes when Apollo is in the room? And still, I don't find Rilke. A man at least in some form of manner representing him, his essence, or a man who has read his work, a man aware of that dilemma called milk career or life crises. I wonder if I tear a piece of paper, write in bold capital letters, Rilke, and hold it up. Will someone stop and chat with me, sit and read with me that poem, ask me questions about it, maybe exchange something about himself, a revelation found through this encounter? If any answer to man's inner quest is to be found on earth, it could be at the feet of this statue or another work of art, at this museum or another like it, in this city or another metropolis such as the many found on this and other continents. And yet his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside, like a lamp in which his gaze, now turned to low, gleams in all its power. Thank you. Rafi Vartanian. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Thank you all for being here. It is an honor to be with you tonight. Uh, there are so many incredible artists, storytellers, thinkers in this room. Alina, thank you. A-A-W-W, -W, thank you. 
Um, ancestors, thank you. So tonight I'll be reading Erasure Poetry that um, I started to work on while I was teaching a creative writing workshop at Rikers Island Jail Complex. And what was great about discovering Erasure there was to sort of see the power that um, Erasure, when, when sometimes governments try to erase its people, when they put them on islands or they throw them in their, uh, you know, uh, jails, prisons, or they try to just erase them from the land, which is what, you know, happened to so many Armenians. So I found uh, in Erasure Poetry an opportunity to not just apply the technique of erasure onto documents that are provided by the government, but also a way to connect with the actual form of trying to take away meaning and purpose and use that to um, discover like a deeper truth. I hope that made sense. I don't know if it did or not, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and I have a series of um, basically documents from various government officials uh, or, you know, major figures of power. So um, I'll sort of tell you what the source text is at the beginning of each one. And then what you're going to hear is um, a intervention that I've done with erasure where I've removed words in order to try to expose the subtext, subtext and the deeper truth, which I'm sort of claiming is the, the deeper truth. Okay, so the first one is called uh, The Message of the Prime Minister of the Republic of Turkey, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, on the events of 1915. The 24th of April carries a particular opportunity. It is the last Armenian citizen. Any conscientious, fair, and humanistic approach to the issues requires suffering as ethnicity. Hierarchies experienced a Turkish proverb, duty to the Ottoman Empire. In Turkey, 1915 is the requirement of democracy and modernity. Perceive this climate of allegations. Understand historical issues. It is natural with empathy from all sides. The Republic of will continue to every idea with, in line with the 1915 as a matter is inadmissible. Our pain is a humane responsibility. Millions of people lost the world during compassion. In today's world, antagonisms are a common future. With the establishment of a scholarly manner to be carried out by Turkish historians, the events of 1915 are at the service of historians. To Turkey, the people of the people, regardless of common values, create a belief about the past with belief that the Armenians rest in peace. We pay tribute under conditions. All right, this next one is called Statement by the President of the United States, Donald, Ch Donald J. Trump, fuck you, on Armenian Remembrance Day. We the horrific grieve courage and those who contributed to aiding survivors and rebuilding communities. We note with deep, deep respect our country as we ensure atrocities are repeated. We underscore the painful past as a necessary step towards creating a more lost future. The next one is Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos's remarks at an all staff meeting from 2017. Good morning. Thank you. You're welcome. I have been, I've been eager to get here. My name is Betsy, and I'm here with you to serve my family. <laughs> this is a humbling opportunity. Let me, let me note you. Join me for a four-hour tour of two office buildings here in the district. I am grateful for Testament Americans have tremendous respect for walls to make more drama. In all seriousness, I am our republic. Words can get hot and unending, and that's okay, but all of us can gather non-traditional students, bending or breaking through education, 
This is what motivates me. Students feel stifled. I pledge to unite around a cliche. I believe befriending ourselves is easier. Obstacles overcome human problems. Adult issues complicate those who we serve. I'm betting on preconceived notions. My challenge to you is simple. Be big and act to serve me. Thank you. <laughs> the next is uh, from Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, he wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post, September 2018. It was called, Protecting Democracy is an Arms Race. Here's how Facebook can help. Our responsibility at Facebook is to amplify heart cyber attacks. America's democratic process has been spam. Advertising is running the United States, but we've gone even further. Anyone can search to see each individual. This greater transparency will increase misinformation. A big part of the solution is false news flagged fact checkers. They lose 80% of future everyone. Tech companies abuse face law. We proactively drive people. We find them. Our security team manually reviews identities. I feel removed and content. We continue to make people adversaries to protect democracy interference. The next is from the Dakota. It's called the Dakota Access Pipeline is the best way to move Bakken crude oil to market. So this is from the uh, oil company that was drilling in the, um, du in the Sioux uh, Indigenous Reservation. Okay. The Dakota Access Pipeline is the crude American consumer's process. It will be $3.8 for the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. The United States Army Corps of Contacts reached beneath the lake. We have great interests using violent disruption. American businesses need to produce jobs. A vital and healthy economy is the rule of law. We Americans reduce foreign power and warm our homes. All right, this next one is uh, from the manual of an AR-15 semi-automatic uh, gun rifle. It's called, General Sa it, it's called General Safety Warnings from Double Star Corp AR-15 Manual. So it's 18 different safety steps. One, careless death must be the first and constant consideration when handling a firearm and ammunition. Two, this rifle was original. Three, this rifle should always discharge. Four, never take anyone's word, trigger the gun. Five, intend to fire. Six, water, snow, mud, oil, grease can, Always check the barrel of your firearm. Clean a fouled gun. Seven, keep the gun's muzzle pointed at another person or at anything you intend to shoot. Always be sure of your target before firing. Eight, store a loaded firearm to children. Nine, always make sure your firearm is loaded. 10, encourage shooting. 11, encourage shooting, especially from other guns close to you. 12, Climb a loaded firearm. 13. Shoot at water. The bullet may ricochet to strike another unintended object. 14. Use this rifle. 15. Firearms and alcohol mix. Take drugs before shooting, as this constitutes your safety. Use a firearm while you are taking medication. 16. Guns can't think. You can. 17. Be a shooter. 18. Follow your firearm. Okay, two more. Um, the last erasure, this is George W. Bush address on signing the USA Patriot Act from 2001, 2002. We all remember the Patriot Act. Good white terrorism. With my signature, this danger. I commend hard nights and weekends. I want to thank the vice I want to thank terrorism. I want to thank the FBI and CIA for waging an incredibly important war. I want a threat like no other. We've seen the enemy our country is. I want positive exposures. Since the 11th of September, our intelligence and law enforcement agencies have been relentless horrors. Horrors. 
Customs secret, our terrorists will help law enforcement identify, dismantle, disrupt, punish. We are changing culture. The number one par priority is surveillance of all communications. Investigations investigate anyone making it easier to lengthen prison sentences. This bill upholds and respects the civil liberties guaranteed by our atrocities. The war branches of our government are united. It is now my honor to sign into law the USA Patriot Act of 2001. And the last poem is not erasure. This is uh, a poem about my mom telling my grandmother about a dream she had about our grandfather uh, several years after he had passed away. It's called Mama's Dream. My mother told my grandmother and me about a dream she had last night. Her deceased father visited and said, have you forgotten me? No, I didn't, my mother protested in her dream. My mother is silent. What happened next, I ask? Well, that's it, she says with a shrug. Then my grandmother inquires, did he ask about me? Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for reading. Is it because I'm swaying? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Um, thank you so much for reading, Nancy, Chris, Lola, and Rafi. And again, thank you so much for AAW for hosting us here. It's very special. Um, again, April 24th co it commemorates Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day. Um, and a little, some of us read um, writing that directly relates to that, some of it tangentially relating. Um, and I think no matter what we write, we're always um, using our experiences and our histories and our cultures in our work. Uh, and what I thought was really interesting was um, all four of you, and not excluding me, I guess I don't think about my grandparents as much, but every one of you mentioned your grandparents in your poems or in your writing in some way. Um, and I, I don't have a question. or I mean, I'm not asking you questions. I'm just I'm trying to invite conversation. And in about 15 minutes or so, we'll ask questions from the audience. So does anyone have anything to say about, like, grandparents? Um, is it a more of a thinking about ancest an ancestors in general? Or is it do you have special relationships with your grandparents that, you know, influence your work? I mean, I guess for me specifically, um, the uh, um, stories um, that are just starting to be spoken by my grandparents um, about the genocide are um, after a really long silence of just sort of pretending that nothing happened and sort of carrying this, um, I guess, like protective veil over the grandchildren or my generation sort of thing. So like events like tonight, I was talking to my meds mama about it and she um, told me another story and these like stories sort of like come out of nowhere but like we had this uncle um who lived in Moosh um and he um was he was nicknamed Gaidzog which means lightning in Armenian and he would sort of be the lookout about like when the Turks are coming he would he was like a very like hyper and like manic sort of man and he made it over to America after the genocide and I, just like little tidbits like that um trying to sort of like resurface after all these years so yeah i think that's very f common like in my family my the elders don't really speak a lot about what they have gone through or um, what they have heard people have gone through and so it's like this long stream of silence and then you know people open up mm -hmm. but, nancy did you oh, yeah, yeah uh, so i um 
when you said that, I was like, I didn't say anything about my grandmother. And then I remembered there's one line. Um, because I've done a lot of work about her, my, my memoirs about tracing her story. She was a survivor as a 10-year-old child. And, and trying to write her story meant, you know, finding a part of myself, but also going to very difficult, painful places. And she was a little different in that she, she would break out and tell her story. Um, and so I wrote my memoir, and it was published in 2008. And so in the last few years, as my, um, my parents have been losing their short-term memory, but their long-term memory is coming and emerging, so I'm discovering things about my mother's side of the family. And, and so one of the impulses for tonight was to connect a bit with her, but also th this idea that our genocide stories, we connect through our family. But like events like this, we hear so many other stories. So how do we, mm -hmm. you know, connect across all those kinds of stories. And I really liked how you began with the, the description of how we come from so many places because of the event. Um, I would, felt closest to my maternal grandmother. And uh, she was orphaned, went through the desert experience, lived with Arabs uh, in a tent, was tattooed, and then finally ended in an orphanage in Aleppo. And we thought we knew all about her stories and then just before her death, uh, Zohab sent her uh, videotaped uh, uh, her for a few hours, and she said even more things that I didn't know about. So it was very in interesting how she opened up to a, you know, uh, a camera <laughs> uh, like that. I, w I was not aware of all, a lot of the nuances of her experience. Well, grandparents and great-grandparents are a huge inspiration for me. Their stories, what they've lived through, uh, how they've survived, where they lived. Um, my mom's parents have lived with us for a long time, and so it was really wonderful to develop a relationship with them, and then through that, start to learn more about uh, where they were from, uh, you know, there's so much to say, and I'm con I've interviewed a lot of my grandparents and great grandparents and their siblings and and descendants, um, and I've transcribed those interviews and I try to um, incorporate those stories into how I think about you know the world as it is today and our generation, and so um, what they've been through is a huge inspiration and. This past summer, um, I went to Turkey for uh, Eastern Turkey for the first time, and I went to the the towns and villages where they were from, and uh, it deepened my appreciation really for what the sort of migratory path that sort of from start to finish in a way, and um, it's really like anyone in the room, you know, the when we talk to our elders, we just learn so much about what the world was like and what our ancestors have been through and what they can teach us. Yeah, it's definitely, and a lot of times also I feel that my, the elders of my family will tell tales that can't be true, you know, but um, it's just mm -hmm. the way they remembered it or the way that it was told to them and I take that as truth anyways. So another connection that I noticed was um, talking about uh, countries or cities or you know landmarks that don't exist anymore and I noticed that in Nancy your, your work your, in Raisin, in Raisin Eyes um, you said something about you know grandparents being from places that uh, names of places that change and um, and Chris you also um, mm -hmm. touched on that with the the village that is now underwater mm -hmm. and of course Rafi you 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 know, erased a bunch of things. So um, that that kind of connection of, you know, you have a history, you have a story, you have a lineage, but you, you can't always take an airplane there. You can't always walk there. Um, it doesn't exist anymore on the map, but it exists in some kind of other place in time. 
I have a thought about that, if I may. Um, this summer, speaking of this trip, I went to Hajun, which is uh, a small village in um, Giligia or Cilicia, and it's sort of a two-hour, three-hour drive north into the Taurus Mountains in southern Turkey. And um, I've always been obsessed with eating red peppers in the morning as like a nice breakfast thing to eat. It's very fresh. There's a lot of water in it, and uh, it's got nice, a nice little, I don't know, pop to it, nice way to start the day. And um, when I was walking around Hajun, it's very hilly. There's a lot of um, sort of, not secret passageways, but like you look over and you can sort of see down a little cliff into like a courtyard of an apartment building or whatever. So when I was walking around, I looked over and I saw like three people in their clothes uh, pulling apart red peppers and like taking out the you know the seeds inside and it's like wow you know they're obsessed with red peppers here who knew um i'm not i'm not claiming that that's where my infatuation with red peppers came from but it was just uh the reason i'm mentioning this is because names of places that change today hajun is called saim bailey it's not called hajun anymore and it's one of many uh places in Turkey where the Armenian name was changed, you know, the way Sis, where the headquarters of the Armenian church, which is now in Lebanon, had been there since as early as the third century, uh, has been changed to Kozan. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, town place names that have been changed. So um, that's a huge thing that's happening. Um, I, my grandmother, my grandmother, ne my grandmother never wanted to, she's talking to me now, she's saying, don't reveal my secrets. <laughs> no, she, she didn't, she never wanted to go back to her village. Um, and it was my aunt who um, had a kind of romantic notion about going back, and I went with her um, when she was, quite elderly and we it, we we went through that experience sort of like what Rafi what you were describing like going to the town and knowing it by its name Istonos and it's now it's called Chem and Yenije and um, I, I had you know this strong feeling that I wanted to go to this place to stand on the land because it would help me know who I was and of course it didn't, and I <laughs> felt like the experience I had of meeting the villagers there was so emotional because they knew what had happened, and that kind of connection was more important than the place. Um, so, and now that I've had that experience, I actually, I've often thought about going back there as well, and I really don't. I, I, I don't know that, uh, that kind of rip in, the, in it, that kind of trauma, I think, is just very hard to revisit. My grandparents have a um, similar um, feeling about going back to the villages, too. They just don't want to. Um, see it again. The village that um, sort of was the uh, the spark for this series um, is called Komk and um, it's completely underwater and you can see sort of like the steeple of where the church used to be sort of like peeking out because the Turks built a dam over it. Um, and I guess for me hearing all of these stories and sort of um, hearing random tidbits of family histories is sort of like sort of looking down into a pool um, and seeing sort of like a, a an icon or something and trying to catch a glimpse of it over the ripples. So I feel like that's, that's sort of like how I, I'm tackling um, that side of it. Uh, yeah, I, I touched on this a little bit in the beginning, but um, Armenia has always 
been for my family this place that no one has ever lived in, in my family at least. And, um, you know, we would talk about it with such joy. Like in Armenia, the, the hills and mountains are luminous. And, you know, and I went there and I was like, oh, <laughs> I, I don't really feel like this is my home. And, you know, it isn't. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think about that with my parents too, because they were born and raised in, in Tehran. And then they moved to America before the revolution in, in the 70s. And, they went back for the first time in the 90s when I went to Iran for the first time. And for them, it was like they had been to a new country. It, everything was totally different. And um, the country that they used to live in didn't exist anymore. And I, I've asked them many times, you know, how, how do you feel Armenian or do you feel American, things like that. And um, I think they exist in a kind of limbo where they don't really feel American and they they don't feel Armenian as in like from Armenia and they don't feel Persian necessarily 100%. They're somewhere spanning the three different countries. And, um, and I think it's really an interesting thing to think about how like places exist in your mind and sometimes they're as real as they are in real life. Um, and then another thing I, men I, I thought about was Lola's mention of food in her poetry. And w one thing I one thing I noticed when I think about my family, my family, when I think about being Armenian, I think the two things that really stick out to me the most are language and food. And I think it's very difficult to separate culture, to separate food from a culture. I think it's it's like when I eat, you know, um, Persian food, or when I eat the food like rice, like really good pot of rice, I really feel at home, and I, I think that's really difficult to separate. And just in the same way as languages, you know, the the, the tool that you use to communicate and express yourself. So um, you mentioned lamajun and pistachio, and um, I guess it's just a yeah. So um, my paternal side of the family uh, left the land, but they didn't suffer greatly massacre-wise. Uh, they were, like, they, the entire family was not killed off, like, on my maternal side. So, on one side, there was, like, absolutely no information about culture, food, and so on. Um, it's whatever they learned in the orphanages. On my paternal side, completely Turkish language skills, very little Armenian. The food, is, knowledge was passed intact. Uh, my grandmother made food every day as if she was still in the in Hassan Bailey, which was a suburb of Aintab in in Silesia and uh, It was very interesting to see the contrast between the two families where there's continuity and then complete er erasure um, so um, My mother also didn't learn how to do those you know traditional cookings as a result she made French food and steak and things like that when I was growing up. Um, but it was, it was very curious to, to see the two sides of the experience. Um, um, and then moving to Washington Heights, going one day to New Jersey, I, I passed by what looked like an Armenian restaurant on my way to buy uh, Lahmejun, which is this Armenian very thin pizza, usually with meat on top. Um, and then I found another store where it was a Turkish store and they had things from my grandparents' birthplace. And I was like, wow. And then I recognized the food, you know, the, the uh, pepper paste and uh, the dried vegetables that you get and you stuff them afterwards and everything looked familiar. It was very surreal for me. And that's when I started writing. But it's true that I all, it all started with visiting Nancy Patel Brothers one day, um, because I realized a connection that is more, in every culture, I think, in many ways. We, we bring the food as we immigrate, and, and we hang around the kitchen, and uh, family visit is around a meal. So this is very much um, cross-cultural, which is great. It's what humanity is all about. So. I've been to Lola's home for dinner, and she always makes a really good spread. And she loves her coffee, and she loves her wine. And she has so much, like, she just, when I think of you and, and 
you and who you are in the world and I just feel like you have this appreciation of the finer things and you have a joy in 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 food and so Lola's taken me to Jersey on the bus over the bridge to to go to these places and um, I, I really value that in, in our friendship. And it was one thing that I wanted to bring out with that Diana Derhovanassian poem because she was, not only was she this amazing poet and translator, she was also amazing host. And people have talked about how she would make these amazing dinners at her home. And, and that the poem about um, food as not just sustenance and the greater meaning of it, I think, f I think for us to take joy in it is really important. It, it, like it's a kind of survival, right? Yeah, and, and I also have experience with, you know, family, like the, the morning, it's like, what are we making for dinner? And it's like, that's what you do all day. And you think about the food and you like hover in the kitchen and um, yeah, everything in, with my, you know, my grandma and my great aunts and, and uncles, like, it's very much seeped into their every day. And, um, it's very, so it is difficult to separate, I guess, just like language. So those are some of the points that I thought were really interesting with all of our work. And I wonder now if, uh, if you have any questions for us, you plural, um, we, would, we could answer them. Chris, I wanted to ask how old your grandparents are. You said that they, it sounds like they're survivors of the genocide, or they? It's different on both sides. Oh. Yeah, so. Can you tell us a little more about them? Yeah, so um, actually on my mom's side, um, I'm part Greek, and my, gr my grandfather is from Lesbos. Um, and then um, on my dad's side, they're all from the region of Husanig and um, Harpert, so. Um, yeah, so lots of um, stories emerging, and um, and actually most of them come from my great aunt, who's like the oldest um, in the family. She's sort of like the matriarch at 92, um, and um, yeah, so. Um, Alina and Nancy, I noticed um, that you both, I mean, a common theme has been going to um, a homeland, whether it be back to Armenia or back to Eastern Turkey or uh, back to um, Iran. Um, and the common theme is that you go there in search of your identity, right? But you end up finding something different, learning about yourself, right? Um, but it, in a surprising way. Um, and as someone who has never taken that journey, I'm sort of, yeah, I must say, I'm curious about this. Um, is that, is that, um, uh, yeah, is, is, did I describe that accurately? Nancy and Alina in particular. Uh, yeah, I think, um, for many years I felt very disconnected from the Armenian community and my Armenianness gr growing up in the 70s and 80s in a predominantly white town. It just felt um, that being Armenian was just this very weird thing. So uh, at some point in my life in my early 30s, um, after I'd kind of lived a life apart from my family, being feminist, being queer, um, I needed that kind of space. Um, but then realizing the loss of not knowing my Armenianness was what kind of brought me to say to my aunt, okay, I'll go with you to Turkey to find our grandmother's village. Um, and, and then later deciding that I needed to go to Armenia itself and feel what it's like to be in a place where your Armenianness wasn't a, it was just a given. Um, and yeah, that the, both those things, they were journeys. I did learn a lot, n n ex exactly, not 
what I was expecting, and um, I, I don't know what else to say about that, just that um, coming through on the other side of both those experiences, um, having appreciation for um, how people find beauty and um, connections amongst each other, even though we often Armenia was a very painful place when I went in 2006. It was like high corruption. And now, to f I don't think anyone would have imagined the revolution at that time. So just to say that we have this great grief, but we somehow we also have this great hope. That, that's sort of what I think I came away with from those journeys. In, in a similar way, I also didn't grow up in an Armenian community, and, and in a lot of ways, my, my parents have only been to Armenia once on vacation, and then they said they didn't really like it, and um, they really talk about Iran a lot, about like, if, they, if they play any kind of music besides American music, it'll be Persian music, and uh, the food, and it's just everything was very seeped in Persian culture, and with my grandparents, my grandma and my aunts and uncles, like they always talk about Armenia, but it's always, like they also never lived there and they just went on vacations a couple times and they love it. They have all these like stories, like everyone in Armenia is a musician, everyone has a beautiful voice, and you know, it's all these <laughs> like inflated stories. And, um, and I, I also never had the chance, well, I was never presented with the opportunity of doing like uh, birthright Armenia. Um, and. Then later in my life, I, you know, I was like, wait, I've never been to Armenia, but I've flown to other places. I could just literally buy a ticket and go. And so that's what happened. And yeah, I didn't find myself there. I mean, not in the way that I thought I would. Um, but, but I guess it takes going somewhere to realize that. And I guess the one thing I did like about going there is that I could speak Armenian. Um, this question is for everyone. Um, as writers and poets, do you ever find yourself uh, feeling challenged by trying to express or translate such a specific experience of being an Armenian American or an Armenian of the diaspora to audiences who may not be from that background to non-Armenian audiences? So um, I've been extremely fortunate that I write in Western Armenian and translate my own work and read it to mostly non-Armenian audiences. Uh, very little translation uh, or explanation is necessary. A lot of the ideas are universal. A lot of people have wars and have suffered, etc. Maybe certain terminology is necessary to explain, like a lahmijun or something. But um, I find that. Um, there is a lot of curiosity about hearing poetry in foreign languages in the original. Um, the challenge is mostly getting on the plane and going there and reading your work. So there's an amazing community of poetry you know, on an international level. Um, so I don't know about fiction and nonfiction, but that's what my experience has been. I would echo that idea just to say that um, there are a lot, the, the Armenian experience in America is a human experience. It's, it's something that people of all uh, backgrounds ex uh, endure and go through. And so um, what I think the, with the greater specificity with which we can talk about and describe what what we go through and all of our variations, I think, resonates the way Lola is saying with other people of different backgrounds. Um, you know, we have our own flavor, but it's like, a, you know, it's like a lahmacun. You know, like what's at the base of a lahmacun is bread, or like grain. You know, everyone has a grain or bread at the bottom of their meal you know it's just what are they putting on top in italy it's marinara sauce and cheese and ethiopia it's like you know delicious stews and but it's bread at the bottom so um 
I think we have our own variation on what's ultimately a very human experience. Um, I'm, I'm still not really sure how to talk about Armenian things, um, and so I guess I just write about pirates now. <laughs> um, but I, I think there is something there about um, water and sort of that distortion because I'm sure the stories as I receive them and as they make them into poems are not literal and are definitely sort of through a imaginary filter. Um, but I think maybe there's merit sort of in that um, transmission that it's happening anyway and that it's happening um, in poetry. So it's still something that I have no idea how to do, but um, hopefully something comes. So. I do struggle with that. Um, I think um, writing a, a queer coming of age story for Armenians was we don't have many of those, so it, it feels like this necessary thing. Um, but I don't know that that always translates to people from other cultures that really gets that, you know, oh, it's just another queer coming of age story. So I, um, I, I, I but I don't think that that's my problem I, as a, a writer. I think. We, we have to create writing for each other as, as well. And, you know, whatever other audiences can get from it, wonderful. There's a, there's a great, I think it's Gertrude Stein quote that says, I write for myself and strangers, which I, I think is a great way to say that to, for the storyteller to prioritize an emotional truth. And um, I just want to say that Nancy's memoir is amazing. If you haven't read it, it's called Me as Her Again. And what I didn't know about that title, and it didn't occur to me until as I was reading it, was that the word for queer is me as her again. Me as her again. And so it was like brilliant. Brilliant. I didn't know until I got in there. And, um, I just I just wanted to give Nancy a shout out because you know. And I'm stealing that line from Gertrude Stein. <laughs> yeah, to kind of continue on uh, what you just said about Nancy's memoir. I'm curious, I mean both Alina and Nancy had mentioned intersecting identities, so like Iranian Armenian identity or queer and Armenian identity. And I feel like oftentimes when you have an intersecting identity, like at that point of intersection is a conflict. And it feels like you have to choose between one or the other. Um, especially when you're in an Armenian culture where it's not super open and accepting to queer people. And so I'm, I'm curious how you've over time embraced both of those things? Um, it's not easy, but I think, <laughs> I think writing helped um, and knowing that, um, that, that other people had my back um, in, in being in spaces like this. Um, and it, it's still hard and it, it's gradual. Um, but also realizing that other Armenian writers have taken risks over the years with their own intersections. Yeah, I, but I, I, I think writing has Right, with writing, you, you get to make your experience real somehow when you see it on the page, and that's a very um, healing thing. And, that, and then to find a way to give it to other people, that, that process has helped me and continues to help me. 
And I think also for my family, in, I remember in high school being very frustrated because I, I didn't grow up, like I said, in an Armenian community, and I felt like my parents weren't really giving me the Armenian side as I wanted it to be given to me. And I, they would say things, they would tell jokes to each other and, you know, speak Persian. And I'm like, this isn't my culture. Like, what do you, like, tell me, like, uh, something about Armenia or, like, tell me more things that I can actually, like I say to people I'm Armenian, but I don't know anything about what that means. And um, I realized later and m maybe more recently actually, um, that if I didn't accept that there is a fluidity between the two, then I just wouldn't be anything. Like um, I would just have to call myself American or something. Um, and so, you know, I, and again, coming to New York, meeting Armenians from, you know, who are unlike my family, my family's mostly from Iran, um, meeting Armenians from all over and realizing, oh, you know, you exist in this kind of, you know, limbo or kind of fluidity between being from Iraq and being Armenian or being from Turkey and being Armenian. And um, it just has to exist. Or if it doesn't exist, then you can't have both, I guess. Or I can't, I can't be Armenian, you know. Um, if that makes sense a little bit. This is a great question. I just, it just makes me think of this idea that I reflect on a lot, which is who decides what it means to be Armenian or American or whatever group we classify as. And there's really two tracks. Like there's the institutional track and there's like all sorts of institutions that will tell the person what, the, what one must believe and, and so on. Or there's the, the individual track where the individual uh defines it for his or herself and um i think there's sort of a way to take the best of both and find something that's ultimately satisfying uh, and exciting and inspiring for the individual so i think when we get institutional definitions of identity that feel oppressive or we notice them in our family environments that are just like echoing these repressive uh ideologies we can you know, th think deeper and more carefully about how that works and how we can go one step further, one step beyond and try to define for ourselves in our own terms what that means. And there's so many examples in history of that happening, including Zabel Yesayam, uh, Diana Derhovanesian, Lola Kundakjan, and so on. Last question. Maybe a little selfish question because um, um, I um, recently became a filmmaker, as Alina knows, and every time I go home, I have my fancy recorder, I have my fancy camera, it's always in the bag. I never take it out when I'm home. I never record what they say. I just, I, it doesn't happen. It's always in the corner. <laughs> and I also am interested in creative writing and it, I never get myself to sit and write about my own history of being Armenian, etc. I always do other things. I, I tell other people's stories. So I was wondering, how, it, how does it work for you? And like, wh when did you decide to be a writer? And then, and then, what's the like, what's the process of deciding what to write now to write? I know Lola, you mentioned a little bit about when you decided to, to write, and I wa I wanted to hear that same story or maybe similar stories from the others. Thank you. So, um, as I said, my, uh, for 25 years I did visual arts. I, I did ceramics mostly, photography a little bit, a little bit of painting. Um, and I wanted to do an MFA in the visual arts. I was very keen on it. Uh, I did a little s side trip to study history and uh, I always liked literature, but it was like for pleasure. Never thought about writing. And then at some point, um, uh, someone in, uh, very accidentally, okay, somebody said at work, um, I want to know so about RSS. And I was like, what the hell is that? You know, real simple syndication where you transmit this data. And I thought she was talking about creating RSS feeds, not you know, reading, getting feeds about, you know, from New York Times or something. So I said, oh, well, maybe I can do this with Armenian poetry. 
and I started the blog, I started posting a few things, started translating for it, and I started seeing a lot of people reading uh, Armenian poetry. And as I was writing more and more and reading more and more, I decided uh, to start writing my own poetry. Um, subsequently, I gave up a studio space where I was sharing with other ceramicists, and it took me two years to make up my mind, but I've never looked back. It, it has given me great pleasure. Uh, it's easier to share my work now on stage or in articles, books, and so forth. I never thought that possible. Uh, it was a blind uh, leap, uh, and I'm, I'm really glad I did it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have many thoughts. Uh, well, I uh, also am a musician, and I've sort of other things, and I try to figure out, like, why write? Why am I writing? Why am I doing it this way? Why am I doing it that way? And I think the answer that I ultimately came to, and I, I'm sure this is not unique, I would imagine that a lot of people have reached this conclusion as well, is that ultimately it depends on the the story that needs to be told and the way that the story is most naturally expressed. So for example, um, you know, a visual story for a writer might come across best as like a screenplay. But if you want to tell a story through dialogue between characters, one would write a play. Or if you want to get into the personal inner psychology, uh, I might write nonfiction. But if I want to tell a story that words could not possibly convey, then I'm going to go with music. Or I might, you know, if I was more capable with visual art, I might go down that path. Um, so I think it's ultimately sort of figuring out the truth of the story and then bringing the medium, finding the medium that is going to be most suitable for that. Um, and then with family stories, I think, uh, you know, I, uh, I also like when I've been in situations as well where I've had re equipment for film or, or audio recording and fa there are family stories being told and I'm like, oh my God, this is so amazing. How can I, how do I record all of this? Like my, I cannot possibly remember this, uh, but I want to hold on to it somehow. Um, so either it becomes either number one after the interaction, just journal it down, write it down somewhere, or number two, go back to that person later and say, I want to interview you. Would you be open to that? You know, I have questions. I'd love to do like an audio or video recording and um, that people are often very excited to have the opportunity to, to share in detail their, their journeys, their stories, and to answer questions like that. Yes, also, um, Gamar, I, I identify with that because I've, I've also wanted to interview my family, and I have, but I think a lot of times, like, they know the camera is on, the recorder is on, and they say things like, oh, my life was great in Iran, there was no trouble, no discrimination, like, you know, um, and it's just like, okay, well... Um, but another way is like sometimes you can use your family experiences and their stories um, by not really, I don't know how to say it, but you can just kind of seep it, like have it like get into your consciousness somehow and eventually it's going to come out in some way. So, you know, when you're with family, you don't, I, a lot of times I just like, you know, sit back, drink tea, <laughs> um, like write down in my in my phone some like weird thing that they'll say, but um, you know if I don't think too hard about it, eventually it's gonna come about in my art and my art writing. So I guess just encouraging you in that way. Yeah, I guess. Any other questions or? Oh yes. Thank you. So who is your favorite? Um, modern writer, be it a feminist or, I don't know, listening to you, to you I forgot your name, like I, I couldn't help but think about Juno Diaz's um, Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde. So in that book he's, he's talking about politics and he's being rebellious and so I was drawing parallels between him and you. When I'm listening to you, Alina, I'm, I 
can't help but think about Jhumpa Lahiri um, because this female writer, she talks about different identities uh, as an American and Indian, and the intersection about those two identities. So who are your favorite American or generally speaking modern writers, feminist, non-feminist? Who are your role models? And how much do you read, guys? Mm -hmm. So I, I try to read every day. Um, and I guess I try to read as variously as I can. Um, so I don't feel like I have one sort of um, idol that I try to emulate. But I guess like a very influential writer for me when I was becoming a poet was the poet C.D. Wright. Um, who I worked with um, in undergrad. Um, and she sort of um, helped um, helped me become sort of where I am. So I, I'll always be grateful for, for her. Uh, if I'm not writing, I'm reading. Um, if I'm writing and I'm editing my work, I'm reading it out loud. That's very important for me. Um, I have many authors I like right now. I'm about to start Caroline Forche's memoir. I really am in awe of anybody who writes about very difficult things like she did about El Salvador um, or the volumes of books that she uh, prepared about cross-cultural experiences, whether in the English language or international experiences. Um, so I think poetry of wit witness is very important for me. Yeah. Uh, writers that made a, a large impact on me are Audre Lorde and Gloria Anzaldúa, and more recently um, Edwige Dantica, a Haitian American writer, and um, Claudia Rankin, citizen. Um, just any writing that experiments with form um, and that breaks through with a strong political voice. And, um, you know, I, I think, yeah, I agree with that. I would say um, different writers resonate in different seasons of life. And uh, I guess for where I'm at now, uh, I'm a big fan of Laylee Long Soldier. She wrote a poem, a poetry collection um, part of it's called Whereas, and then Margot Jefferson is a critic and memoirist. Ron Power wrote a book called No One Cares About Crazy People, which was very moving. And then I'm forgetting the name of the author, but it's a graphic memoir about um, intergenerational family arc from Vietnam to America called The Best We Could Do. And it's a very powerful uh, graphic me memoir. Um, and I also like draw inspiration from music and any musician who I feel like is, especially instrumentalists who are playing with like a real emotional clarity. Aradink Jun being one of them, certainly. And I am a big fan of Nancy and Lola's as well. And I'm a fan of Maggie Nelson, uh, no, I'm sorry, Gertrude Stein. I also like Maggie Nelson, but Gertrude Stein, as was mentioned, um, Lydia Davis and Lynn Tillman. And I find connections with all of them, like long sentences, short sentences. Um, it's a very simple way to describe it. But um, <laughs> yeah, Lynn Tillman recently, she has a book out called American Genius, a Comedy. And it was published 10 years ago, and it just got republished, which is a really nice thing that happened um, since the first press was a small press, and they didn't redistribute. So uh, I also see her walking around in the East Village a lot. So it's just fun. But yeah, I, I also like to read varied works like poetry, fiction, nonfiction, philosophy, even if I don't always understand what they're saying. Um, I think it's, it's really good to expose yourself to a lot of text. And I try to read as much as I can. But yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for the, to the readers. I thought this was a really beautiful event, and a lot was, was spoken, and yeah.
Big round of applause to everyone. Thank you. Folks, we have books available in the back, and you're welcome to stay and mingle for a little bit. Thank you for coming.